the summer is a time that we are to just kind of get refreshed from the year. Uh, being so cold up here all the time, it's a great time for us to be able to get out and enjoy the weather. Hopefully it gets a little bit more uh, warmer than it has recently. Um, this summer, I'm hoping that we are refreshed as a church. Uh, our desire this summer is not just that we um, kind of float by during the summer and wait till Caleb comes back, or um, we take the summer off when it comes to walking with the Lord, but this is a time where we can get refreshed in our walk with the Lord. This is a time where we're able to kind of sit back, look, and uh, take note. Uh, measure where we've been, uh, what, our, what our week has been like, what our couple months have been like, um, to be able to evaluate where we need to go. Where, where am I on my journey and, and what does it look like? Where do I need to go next? What we're, uh, as, as we like to look at refreshment, I know that as I say, I want to be refreshed in the Lord this summer. I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. Uh, all of you know that as you go on vacation, usually the, the hardest part of vacation is getting ready to go on vacation. Uh, you have to pack the bags and get everything else ready. As much as I enjoy going to the beach, sometimes I don't want to go to the beach because I have to get all the stuff packed and all the food and everything else and get prepared and plan to go. So even when we get refreshed in the Lord, it takes a lot of work. Uh, but when we have the time, it's time for us to be able to look, uh, to breathe, but also to get into the Word, to, to spend time with Him. This summer, as elders, we kind of discussed what we wanted to do, and we felt like the Psalms is a place that we can go to. Uh, it's a place that we get refreshed and we have time to kind of look at things. We're going to be doing, uh, for the whole sermon series, we're going to be doing uh, the book of Psalms. Uh, we'll do it for 12 weeks. Uh, we're going to be hitting all different types of Psalms. And uh, I kind of look at Psalms, there's so many different types and different aspects of ways of looking at Psalms. I kind of look at Psalms as a taco. Um, not just a taco in the sense of like a, a soft shell only in meat. I'm talking maybe you put a soft shell and a hard shell in with um, you have sour cream and olives and onions and guacamole. Well, that, that's kind of gross to me, but maybe some of you like that. But all of the different blends and aspects are so much inside wrapped up in Psalms uh, that it's just you can't just uh, sit here in one introduction and just talk about it and that's it. Uh, there's so much more when it comes to uh, the Psalms. Uh, there's many of us who uh, sit here uh, that I talk to about doing the Psalms and uh, the first thing I hear is, oh, I love the Psalms. And they would tell me their favorite Psalm. And they tell me what uh, God has taught them through. And I think a lot of us know the refreshment and the joy that Psalms has. We also know that there's times where we have to go through hard, uh, difficult decisions that we have to make as we walk through the Psalms. But there's so much that is uh, blended in the Psalms. Martin Luther says, it is therefore easy to understand why the book of Psalms is the favorite book of all saints. For every man on every occasion can find it in the Psalms, which, which fits his needs, which he feels to be as appropriate as if they had been set there just for his sake. In no other book he can find words to equal them, nor better words. There's this... Uh, unknown writer that wrote this about psalms i think this kind of gives a greater picture of what the psalms is it's this book is the mind of god the state of man the way of salvation the doom of sinners and the happiness of believers its doctrines are holy its precepts are binding its histories are true and its decisions are immutable read it to be wise believe it to be safe Practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is a traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is the grand subject, our good, its design, and the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. Follow its precepts and it will lead you to the Calvary, 
to the empty tomb, to the resurrected life of Christ, yes, to glory itself for eternity. I think that wraps up just a greater picture of what the Psalms is. And I, I think as I talk today, it's not just about the Psalms. I think all of this can be about what the Word of God is. Uh, but there's something special about the Psalms when we look at it and, and how it grasps our heart. So our question today is, how do we approach the Psalms? As we spend this summer kind of looking at it together, we're going to be doing stuff together through it. I'm going to ask you to be a part of this all summer long. I'm not asking you just to come to a sermon on Sunday and listen to it, uh, but I want you to be interacting with the Psalms all summer to be refreshed in the Word as a body. So, so what does this look like? How do we approach the Psalms? Um, how are we going to be refreshed by it? There's a couple points we're going to make, and we're going to kind of look at uh, our first uh, psalms uh, as we walk through this. But the first point I want to make today is the psalms is a book of instruction. We need to look at it and approach it like it is instruction. It's not a book of poems and, and nice sayings that we should glance on and move on to. Uh, some people will even say, uh, even famous uh, writers of the day or preachers have said that they wouldn't preach on psalms because it's more of uh, poetry and different aspects that are difficult. Uh, but the psalms is also instruction. It's God's word, just like every other part of the Bible. Uh, it's just as important as the first, four, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, the most, uh, one of the evidence of this that you see is uh, the book, the Psalms is, book, is broken up in five parts. Uh, as you'll see in your, your Bible, it'll kind of say 1 to 41 for the first, for ha first half. And at the end of each book, you see that there's this doxology. Doxology is when um, it's kind of a short hymn just praising God, and it kind of breaks up each book. But as you uh, kind of look at each book, it doesn't seem... It, it doesn't really seem like the books are very distinct. Like, you know, you can look at, um, you can look at uh, Colossians and see where it's going. You can see uh, what different books have specific purposes. Well, when you look at the five books broken up, you can see David in, in a couple of them. There's praise focused on one. But it's not really focused on a, a specific uh, genre or a specific way. But the reason that they break it up in five, and this, in, the reason that they uh, decided to do this was because he wanted to remind us of the Torah, that the five first books, that the Psalms is no different from any other book. It's just like the Torah. It's just as important. It has the, the Genesis, the Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's just as important. That's kind of the point and the reason that they put that there is that so that we can realize that this is instruction just like any other book. We don't change how we look at it. Uh, we, we look at things a little bit differently, but not in instruction. We still see it as important as everything else that we read in the Bible. Now, the other evidence that comes in uh, to play is the book of Psalms, uh, Psalms 1. Um, Psalms 1 is our introductory to the whole 150, uh, 150 Psalms. This is the first one. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but the, the first Psalm and the second Psalm, they say, are kind of blended together as one. They're very different, but there's uh, some bookends that kind of put them together. But this first book... I think it's always significant when you have an introduction, there's kind of a main point that it's trying to bring across. So what is Psalms 1 doing? And as we look at this passage, it is about, again, it's about instruction, about God's word, uh, that as we hold on to it, we'll see the importance of it. So it's warning us, it's preparing us, it's saying this is what, how you need to look at this psalm. So this is one kind of aspect and approach that we have to approach the psalms with. Now, I'm going to read just the first uh, part of Psalms. Uh, it says, Blessed is the one who, who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, take or sit in the company of marker, mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Now, how I look at this passage is kind of broken up uh, in different ways, uh, but I'm going to look at it as kind of two pathways. Uh, how many of you seen Amazing Race before? All right, raise your hands. I'm from a small church, so I'm used to kind of interacting a little bit more. So 
If you've heard of Amazing Race, Amazing Race is uh, this great show on TV. I guess it's great. I don't get to watch it as often, but it's people that run around the world having instruction that they have to follow, and they have to beat other people to be able to win a big prize. And this is kind of like this amazing race in a sense that we have this pathway of two people who have instruction manuals uh, and that they're going to not only go on an amazing race, it's a short time, but for all of their lifetime, uh, that it is an, a pathway that they're going to be taking. But the importance of what we're looking at is they are focused on what their instruction manuals are. Who's, who are they following? Who are they being led by? And by that alone, you'll see that their paths are very different. And that's kind of the aspect that you hear. There, there's, a, there's a difference between the two, that there's a wicked and a blessed man. You'll see the paths that they take because of who they will follow. Now, as we look at this, the first two uh, parts of this passage, it describes uh, what and who each person is and what kind of path they're going to take and how they get there. Uh, number two, as we get into uh, verse three and four, it'll say, it'll ask the question, what did they accomplish? What did they produce? And when we get to uh, verse five and six, we'll see that it, what is the end result of this journey? So as we're going on this journey together, and we're thinking about a journey with God through the summer and for the, our whole life, we're going to look at this passage and see these two different people. And in this first passage, we see this great man, this blessed person. Blessed means happy, uh, that he is joyful. You'll see blessed all over the book of Psalms. It is one that is happy, that is content, that is joyful, uh, seeing God in greater light. Uh, in this first passage, you see this blessed man. He is one who doesn't walk uh, in the step of the wicked. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners. He doesn't, he doesn't sit in the company of mockers, uh, but he delights in the law of the Lord and meditates day and night. He doesn't pay attention to anyone outside of the, wall, the law. He looks and meditates on what's in front of him. He doesn't uh, get veered to one way. He doesn't follow into the sin of others who are going in that, that direction. He follows the instruction manual that is in front of him. And as we look at, uh, as I talk about this, I'm talking about this instruction manual. This is kind of this instruction that we have. And as he's reading it, this is how he's following and, and kind of walking. I think it's important to see uh, this blessed man is... In the, ver in the next verse, sorry, um, it says, But those who delight in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. Uh, there's this reflection in the book of Joshua that starts off. Uh, Joshua is now given this uh, great kingdom. Moses is gone. Uh, he dies. And God says, Now, Joshua, you're going to bring him into the promised land. And so Joshua is given this opportunity to do this. And this is kind of what God says to Joshua in ver Joshua 1 7 through 9, he says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. It's the same kind of context uh, Joshua is being told, look, don't, don't veer to other aspects, don't, don't veer off of the word of God, follow my instructions to a T, follow where I go. As we look at this instruction manual, it's kind of like a GPS, it tells you where to go and you follow. And it's the same way as we look at it here is Joshua is supposed to do whatever God has said, and he's supposed to follow and be obedient. So this blessed man is the one on the right, that journey he's walking down, that he's supposed to be following and doing whatever God has to say. Now we have this other man, this wicked man, as it says. He's the one that listens uh, to others. Uh, he's the one that he walks in the, the, uh, the places of scoffers. It's pretty much saying that he is walking in sin as everyone else is as well. And then he's mocking uh, pretty much the word of God. When you see this evil person, um, there's almost a progression that you see in this first part. It says he, he walks and then he stands and then he sits. It's almost like he's starting to walk and, and listen. He's starting to kind of just 
kind of looking the other way and starting to talk and listen a little bit. And he starts to hear what the other people are saying, uh, listening to something outside of the word of God. And then you all of a sudden see that he's now he's not walking anymore and just hearing a little bit. He's standing. Now he's standing in the sin itself, walking in the same pathway as the other people that are telling him to walk that way. And then you see him sit in the company of mockers. So now no longer is he walking. No longer is he just looking at the things that uh, other people are doing. Now he's mocking the, the word of God and going another direction. This is the pathway of the wicked. This is where they're going. Their instruction manual is not only others around them and what the world says, but what they say, what they believe, uh, how they want to live their life. There's two instruction manuals. And, and as we get to this next part, we see, you know, how, uh, how do we continue on the path that we're supposed to be? Now, as we talk about this instruction manual that um, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to look at the songs and approach it as instruction. I think if we just stop there, then we're going to miss what Psalms is all about. Psalms is not just about instruction. It's much more than that. Um, Psalms is a, a, a book uh, to teach us to walk with God and develop a deeper intimacy with God. Um, I think John Piper said it the best out of anyone I've listened to when he uh, started the introductory to Psalms. Uh, he said that uh, the Psalms is thinking and feeling with God. It's uh, taking the knowledge and the truth that you see in, in the book of Psalms uh, seeing that, understanding it, but also taking that intimacy walk with God and be able to, to deal with all the emotions that the Psalms have and be able to take them together, and that's where the instruction goes. Uh, see, our instruction manual is not a manual that we just listen to the instruction, but it's living with the Almighty God who instructs us and takes us down that path. It's not alone, it's not by ourselves, it's not looking at the Word of God and getting a couple little things out of it and walking away from it, but it's about getting into the Word and sitting there with God and saying, teach me, teach me, Lord, show me where you want me to go. It's a greater intimacy with God, and, and I promise you, if you do that in the book of Psalms, if you deal with the emotions and the different things that are going on uh, during this time and not just look at it and spend five minutes and walk away from it, but you allow it to kind of get into you, you will be changed. Uh, there's no way of going around it. I think what happens is if we, uh, what happens if you have an instruction manual and the instruction manual kind of gets you to the edge of a cliff and then uh, you look down to the cliff and there's this great river that go is rushing by and there's these rocks over here and then you see a waterfall. And you look on the instruction manual and it says jump. There's many times that God does that. In his word, he challenges us to greater things. And there's a lot of times that it's easy for us to start to look at the word of God and see, and we might read it for five minutes, and then we look for another way to go. We try to find the easy pathway to go where we need to go. And, and usually there is an easier way, an easier way in, 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 in the sense of not dealing with it. Uh, we kind of see that path to the left that makes it easy, goes that winds down, down to the ravine, walks right across. Uh, you know, you get across the river with no problem. You're able to get to the path that you're supposed to get to. It's easy. But see, God doesn't always do that that way. I think most of us know that. But as we look at the Psalms, we see that. Uh, there's times of lament. There's times where uh, he, chat, he talks about judgment. And there's times he talks about really difficult things that he wants us to deal with it with. See, this intimacy and relationship with God is not taking the instruction alone, but taking that instruction and saying, Lord, what do I do with this? And how do I follow this? Not just saying, oh, I hear this great thing that says that I'm supposed to give up all of my riches and give up everything and go and live with you. Well, that doesn't seem possible, so I'm going to go down the easy path. But have you sat down in front of that cliff and wrestled with God with those issues? I think that's what we should be doing with all of the book of the Bible, all the books of the Bible. That when we get to that ravine up top, see, God is dealing with us. He wants us to wrestle with the fact that he's telling us to, to jump off that cliff. And he wants us to trust us. It's like, Jacob, we have to wrestle with God. I don't trust you enough. 
There's that deep, you, you see in the emotions of the Psalms that these people are wrestling with these things. Why is God allowing this to happen in my life? David is wondering why God is allowing Saul to persecute him and try to kill him. There is these wrestle, these issues and emotions that they're dealing with that we have to wrestle with. And so when we get to that cliff, God is calling us to take this instruction manual and take it in front of him and walk with him in it. We need to uh, not sit back, uh, but, but to see a greater purpose in what God is doing. I want to I challenge you, uh, when I think of this jumping off the cliff, uh, sometimes we think, uh, we look at God in a logical way, uh, but sometimes we forget that God did some really crazy things or made people do some crazy things that didn't make a lot of sense. When I think of the wall of Jericho and Joshua and, uh, you know, God can, can do anything. If he says, you know, this is your land, he says, you know, this is your land, here you go, take it. So God could have just went like this and it could have been done. But he didn't do that. What did he do? He made him walk around the city every day, probably getting mocked and getting hit, uh, beaten, or possibly stuff being thrown at him. And every day they had to go and, and walk around believing that God was going to break it. And then on that seventh day, they had to do it seven times they walked around. It seems outrageous to me, doesn't it to you? Why would God do that? But see, I think about every day, think about being at that place that every day I have to get up and go, all right, Lord, this doesn't make sense, but this is your instruction, and so I'm going to have to just trust you. And I can see the wrestling that they must have been feeling through this time. And how great it was when those walls fell down because finally they saw a greater God than they did before. See, when we go over that cliff and trust God, we see a greater God. If we do the pathway, you'll never see this great, a powerful God that's in front of us. And that's why we have to wrestle with the book of Psalms. We have to wrestle with all the books and see that even if we don't want to do it, that we still have to sit in front of it and talk to God about it. It's a relationship with God. It's not just a thinking and hearing it, but also feeling and, and walking through it with God. Every part and every aspect, he is that intimate. He wants to be with you in every aspect of your life. It's not just five minutes or ten. He wants all of it. When he says meditate it day and night, he's saying there's these meditation is this groaning, is there's this uh, reiterating, talking it through. It's a constant being reminded. Uh, even meditation talks about groaning as lions. Uh, that's one of the uses of it. It's this inner I kind of think of this groaning. It's just this deep intimacy with God, walking through every passage with him in a greater aspect. I want to read just, just this uh, one thing from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who talks about intimacy. He says he began, uh, he began by imploring to the ancient psalmist, by talking to the psalmist, he said, you appear to us like an image from a pleasant dream that we long for, yet find so distant from us. We are attracted to you, but we no longer understand you. Teach us something about the silence of the soul, the soul that waits for God. He says this, he goes on, he says, We are so afraid of silence that we chase ourselves from one event to the next in order not to, have to spend a moment alone with ourselves in order not to have a look at ourselves in the mirror. We are not only afraid of ourselves and self-discovery, we are much more afraid of God, that, we may dis that, we may, that he may disturb us and discover who we really are, that he may take us with him into the solitude and deal with us according to his will. I think we do that often. I think it's easy for us when we're having a hard time with God that we put the word of God to the side because we're afraid. We're afraid of dealing with those emotions. We're afraid of talking to God. We feel horrible and wretched for the things that we've done in the past and we haven't dealt and realized that he's forgiven us. We even allowed him to forgive us because we're putting him aside and not listening. We're not even giving him an opportunity to show how great and powerful he is. I hope when you think of this instruction, this instruction manual again is, is instruction that we're supposed to follow, but it's also this pathway and intimacy with God that we need to follow. 
So that's just to give you, that's the greater aspect that I want you to, to be able to take with Psalms. But let's look at how this kind of uh, goes about. What, what happens from here? Let's look at the, uh, the wicked man now. Uh, we talk about uh, what do they accomplish uh, on the blessed and the w- wicked man? What did they accomplish during this time? So let's look at the next part of this passage. It says that person is like a tree. Uh, this talks about the one who delights in the word. So we're talking about the blessed person. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Now, this word planted it actually means transplanted. And I think this is a great aspect because it's reminding us that God is the one that's putting us right by that stream. He is the one helping us to be able to do this. If you're going to the word of God and thinking that you have to do all these things to make it work, you're, you're mistaken. This is a part about God being a part of this relationship with you. There are times where you're going to feel dry and you've gone to that well so many times. You're like, where is God in the midst? But God says he wants to see, are you going to trust him even when it's dry? There's many people I've met that have been dry for years. They've been having a hard time, but they keep persevering. And through that time, God took them through a desert and taught them so much and brought them to a place that they needed to go. And it proved to them, you know, it showed to God that this, is, this person wants to continue to follow God. There's something greater in those aspects. That there is something that uh, getting in front of God, that God is the one that's going to help us to do it. If you're putting it all in yourself to do this and you're missing it. If you feel like God is not being present, then it's time to be able to sit in front and be honest with him. Ask him what is going on. I think... God is big enough to deal with those questions. Look at, look at David. He wasn't afraid to tell him how he felt. He was angry. He told him. Uh, he was frustrated. He didn't understand why God was blessing the rich. He was honest with God. That's what God wants. He wants us to just pour our hearts out and just not be afraid to be honest with him. If you feel like you're not where you are, sit down and wrestle with him with that. Walk with him in a greater way. When we look at this person that is uh, prospering, he, because he's by the stream, because, because his roots are put and poured into the word of God, he is always prospering in everything he does. And it's because he didn't sway to the wicked, he focused just on the word of God. The word of God promises that if you follow me, if you listen to my truth, then you will see, you will prosper, you will grow, you will be mighty in my name because I am the one, I am the stream, I am that power that's going to be able to do that. I think there's many promises that tells us if we go to that stream, if we trust in his word, we'll see that, that that man will prosper. And so we see a person of instruction. We see that he is walking in this pathway and that everything will prosper. Now it says in verse 4, not so the wicked. They are like shaft that winds blow away. So everything they did or everything they tried to accomplish became nothing. Uh, they look back and all the stuff that they tried to do became nothing. And if you look at the word of God, it says anything that you did on your own or did by yourself or doing that, that had no purpose in God, it'll be burned away. There'll be nothing left of that. But if it's in the glory of God, if it's in for Christ, you'll see those things will be left there. You'll see it when you go to heaven. You'll be uh, blessed for those things. He'll say, well done and good faithful servant. But this wicked man who followed the pathway of others and listened to others' instruction, he is the one uh, that doesn't see anything produce. And, and, and I, I, I want to be careful. I, I want to remind us that we think of this wicked person as not possible to be over in this aspect. But as you see a person who just walked by, uh, they started to get enticed and then they sat And it's easy for us to walk into those areas as well, that we follow into those places. If our daily life is filled with everything else of the world and not of God, where do you expect it to go? If you're not reading the word and and talking to him and working through it, then your life is not going to be able to prosper and grow. Maybe out of your own intellect for a time, it'll work for a little bit and things will be good. But overall, on the greater pathway, it's not. There's no way it's going to prosper. So this wicked man has nothing to show for his accomplishments all over these years because he listened to the the lies that were not true, that the word of God is true and only his word is true. 
Let's look at the, the last, last part of this passage. It says, uh, so where do they end up? It says, therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. We're going to flip this once here. The wicked is the one that will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He has done everything outside of who God is, uh, and he's done nothing for God, and there is no way that he should think that he will be in front of him, uh, that he will be able to go to heaven to be with him. And you see the righteous man that God, it says the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. He will be there. He will, he will be with you as he promised but the wicked leads to destruction. This Psalms is, the book of Psalms and Psalms 1 is just a, a pathway that we have a choice. We have a choice to be able to spend and read this word and see it the same way as God. He's saying, if you do this, if you take my words and make it a part of your life every day, then you will prosper. Not prosper in your way, but prosper in the way God has made and designed you to be. Uh, he's going to make you even greater than you have ever thought in how he wants you to be. There is something uh, that we need to look at when we look at this is that God is uh, wanting us to look at his word in a greater way. And I hope as we look at this Psalms, it should be how we look at all the rest of the Psalms in the word of God in general. That as you take this, uh, this pathway during the summer, I want to challenge you to walk through it together. Um, to be able to sit down in the Word and not just take five minutes, but spend time looking at it. If you have a hard time during the day uh, because your days are filled, take some cards with you and write it out. Write, some, uh, write uh, the psalm for the week uh, and spend time just thinking on it, uh, saturating yourself with the Word. Uh, it says, and there's a command in the Bible, it says that we're supposed to teach to one another. It's not about meditating and just getting it what we're getting. But if we are learning from the great God and he's helping us prosper, that fruit is being able to, to be poured out to other people. If he's teaching us and he's teaching you and that we're called to teach one another. And so as you are learning, you should be able to look and see who else you can, you know, ask the Lord. Who can I use this wisdom that you gave me today? How can I use this to grow uh, others as well? This summer, um, we're going to take, we're going to give you a book uh, as you leave, uh, if you want it. It's uh, a little kind of a devotional that we put together um, that's giving you an opportunity to go through each psalm that we're doing every week. Now we're going to be doing different genres. There's laments. There's praise. There's uh, there's remembrance, there's historical, there's royal, there's so many different aspects that we're trying to bleed them all as best as we can into a whole great uh, taco of the Psalms uh, for the summer. And that's kind of where we want to kind of take you this summer. Um, this is a devotional that will take you, we want you to, to spend time in that Psalm all week. Pour into it, think through it, take time. There's other psalms that kind of fit those categories as well. Uh, there's a genre and a background that give you a little idea about it. Uh, there's further reading that you can kind of think on the same aspects so that you can spend time with that during the summer. We have questions here to be able to ponder. These questions are not just based in one area or a specific thing I'm looking for, but there's times where I'm we're asking for just... I, I want you to get in the Word. Um, there's, there's opportunities at the bottom of this that give you, um, is it in the back? Yes, there's uh, research tools, online tools to be able to help you to look at the Word more. I want you to investigate, take time. There's action points where I want you to take time and, and look at those things. There's times where it says, as Caleb talked about, you know, the Psalms is a place to be able to sit and worship and, and to praise God. That's a part of it as well, that we want you to do that, and we put that in here as well. Um, so we're going to give this to you at the end of the service. We want you to spend time with it all week. I want you to be refreshed in God. I, I wanna, I, I'm excited for this for myself, that I need this, that I need to be challenged and thoughtful. And if you're having a hard time, if you don't like where your walk is, stop putting it off. Take it, say, look, Lord, you promise if I seek you, I will find you. 
If I come to you, uh, you will provide, you will do those things. So let's trust God for something greater, not on our own standards, but him, and go to him uh, for that this summer. Let's trust him. Let's, any, any discouragement, anything that you're afraid of, put aside and say, you know what, I'm going to take these 12 weeks and take this serious and go from the Lord. And if you're still having a hard time, then you go to people and talk to us. Talk to us about how we can walk through this with you. Now, I want to give a little bit of uh, thank you to Keenan. Uh, sometimes we look at our elder Keenan as um, just the worship leader. Uh, but one of the reasons we uh, called him as an elder and saw him as an elder is because he has great knowledge. Uh, he is, I, I am convinced he has a spiritual gift of knowledge. He has wisdom. When you ask him when we talk about ideas that we want to do in church, he's always, you can see his pages turning to the, the books in scripture that kind of fit those categories. He's always thinking about where the word is leading. And he put this together. I helped with the questions, but this was him. Uh, he was able to put this together. If you have questions, he is a man that has a lot of wisdom and understanding too, as well as Harry. would love for you to walk with this together, not on your own. Walk with it with the Lord, but let's talk to each other about this as well. So again, you'll get this on the way out. I want to end kind of this uh, part with a story of a young man uh, who came to Socrates uh, asking for knowledge. He walked up to the muscular philosopher and said, Oh great Socrates, I come to you for knowledge. Socrates recognized a pompous numbskull uh, when he saw one. He led the, man, the young man through the streets to the sea and chest deep in water. Then he asked, what do you want? Knowledge, O oh wise Socrates, said the wise young man with a smile. Socrates put his strong hands on this man's shoulders and pushed him under. under. Thirty seconds later, Socrates led him up. What do you want? He asked again. Wisdom, the young man sputtered. Oh, great and wise Socrates. Socrates crunched him under again. Thirty seconds passed, thirty-five, forty. Socrates led him up. The man was gasping. What do you want, young man? Between heavy, heavy, heaving breasts, the, the fellow wheezed, knowledge, oh, wise and wonderful. Socrates jammed him under again right away. Forty seconds passed. Fifty. What do you want? Air, the young man screeched. I need air. Socrates then said, when you want knowledge as you just wanted air, then you will have knowledge. If we seek God as he is the almighty instructor and only his instructions are going to get us to that place, then, then, then when we seek it in that way, oh, we'll see God move. He is greater than what you see in front of you. If you start to trust in his pathways and see him, he will not disappoint you. Seek him deeper this summer. I challenge you to do that. Let's end in a word of prayer. Holy God, all of us are thirsty for more. And sometimes we don't know how to drink from uh, your stream. We don't know how to get there. And so we ask you to transplant us. We ask you to put us there. Show us how. Lord, all our hearts are yearning. We want you. You've called us when we have come to know you. You have put a yearning in our heart to be close to you. And even when it hurts, there's, it's still there. It doesn't leave. It's still there. So, Father, quench our thirst by coming to us this summer. Show us your heart. Show us who you are. Put us aside so we see a greater and almighty God who wants to work in our hearts to cleanse those things that hurt us and free us from the sin in our life, and free us from all the things that we're still holding on to, so that we can see the freedom in your truth, Lord. Jesus, we just ask you to work on our hearts. Let us take this seriously, Lord. Let us not put this aside this summer. Let us not put it aside today, but, but to seek you with all we can. We come to your well. We come to your stream asking you for more. So God, we come trusting you today. In Jesus' name, amen.